Harley Quinn's had a crazy rise in the last 20 years, going from Mr. J's girl to having more live action shine than some of the Justice League. So we're looking at 10 of the things that you may have missed throughout her tenure, from Margot Robbie's take all the way to some of her canceled adaptations. Also, maybe spoilers for those canceled things, I really can't be too careful on here. So maybe some bad news starting out. We might not actually be seeing the live action version of Harley again too soon. Well, at least she probably won't be played by Margot Robbie if her interview with Entertainment Weekly is anything to go by. In it, she said, I was like, ooh, I need a break from Harley because she's exhausting. I don't know when we're next gonna see her. And yes, the oof was important to keep in the quote, not just because it was kind of funny, but also because Harley is a pretty intense role, both physically and emotionally, especially with Robbie's take on the character, so it does make sense. How long that break is though, we'll have to wait and see. Continuing with Robbie's take as what is probably going to be Robbie's last time as Harley for a bit, the only film version of The Suicide Squad that matters was written in sort of a weird way. So instead of writing it in a linear way like from start to finish or starting with the ending and working his way back, James Gunn in a tweet said that he started with Harley's speech before even starting on the screenplay. What's so interesting about her speech in that movie is that so far, Harley Quinn has had the biggest arc of any character in the DCEU and that speech solidifies that. It's kind of wild that a character that was created as a sidekick to the Joker has gone through such a big change. And then some characters, I won't name names because I know how the comment section is, kind of just stay the same. Aside from the costume and the mallet and the hyenas, one of the most iconic things about Harley is her voice. <gasps> it's true! It's this high-pitched New Yorker accent that either really annoys you or endears you to the character. I fit in that last bucket, but for Margot, nailing down that voice was one of the hardest parts for her. In an interview with the Washington Post, she said, From the comic books, I knew that she originated from Brooklyn, but David didn't want it to be full Brooklyn like I did in Wolf of Wall Street. It took a while to find the right level of pitch. The goal was to kind of find some sort of middle ground where I could go higher for comical moments and go lower for more real moments. For me, I think she did a great job with the voice that makes it different enough from the other takes on the characters. Maybe I just really like high pitched Brooklyn accents. Much to think about with that. Now, Robbie's become the de facto live action version of Harley, but that's mainly because the other two had issues, which we'll get to, but in the movies at least, Robbie's the queen. Again, I have to talk about the first Suicide Squad, but just tangentially. So David Ayer always had Robbie in mind, but she also had a lot of competition for the role. Here's just a few of the women who could have been running around in that red and black suit. Mary Elizabeth Weinstead, who ended up actually joining the DCEU later, Lily Collins, Sarah Paxton, Emily Browning, Emma Watson, Zoe Deschanel, and Olivia Wilde, just to name a few. Emma Roberts was also in talks to play the clown princess, but she actually ended up turning it down. Personally, I'm glad that Robbie got it since I think she nails the energy and really feels like she could snap at any moment. But there is a universe out there where Hermione is also committing crimes in Gotham, and I'm honestly very glad that I don't live there. Now, most people know that Harley first debuted in Batman the Animated Series, and if you didn't, bonus thing, but the inspiration for Harley actually comes from a kind of strange place. So Paul Dini and Bruce Timm are both credited with her creation, but Paul Dini says that he was inspired by this weird dream sequence in an old episode of Days of Our Lives. But the connection actually goes even further because the actress in that scene, Arlene Sorkin, is friends with Paul Dini, so he called her up to also do the voice as he felt like she had the right stuff to bring her chaotic and childish personality to the show. Sorkin's also been the voice of Harley for a bunch of other projects like Arkham Asylum and Gotham Girls, which was a web show back before that was a cool thing to do, with Tara Strong, who would end up later replace her, specifically in the Arkham series, although she's done other DC projects as Harley since. Now, I just need to find out where Condiment King's inspiration came from, because that seems like a much harder idea to come up with. So when you think of Harley, you probably think of a lady with a twisted, but funny sometimes, sense of humor who can do the best Olympic gymnast routines, but doesn't actually have any powers. But that isn't true, and that's thanks to Poison Ivy. In the story where this iconic cover comes from, we find out that after Joker launched Harley on a rocket because he was too afraid of his feelings, she crash lands and Poison Ivy rehabs her just because she's kind of bored. And part of that rehab is she gives her the serum that Poison Ivy made that gives her an immunity to most toxins and acids, and it even enhances her physical abilities by some measure that Dini didn't feel like telling us. This story was also the beginning of Ivy and Harley's friendship that would later turn into Harley's most healthy relationship, 
although not sure if that's really saying much. With Harley being a fan favorite from the jump, you'd think that she'd also have a pretty successful comic run, and you'd be wrong. Well, only if you count her first crack at it. Back in 2000, Carl Kiesel penned his run, but because of lackluster sales at the time, the series was handed off to AJ Lieberman in 2003 after Kiesel's run ended in 2002. Lieberman's run apparently renewed interest, but obviously not enough, because unfortunately, his run didn't even last a year. Since then, Harley's had multiple solo runs, ranging from great to not so great, but it seems like the majority of her interest comes from her team-ups and, of course, her tenure on The Suicide Squad. Harley's self-titled 2021 run is going strong, and with Harley having multiple solo runs at this point, I doubt she'll face the same fate as she did during her earlier days. So we already talked a little bit about how Robbie's take on Harley Quinn was the first movie version of the character to actually make it on the screen, but she wasn't the first live action version. In fact, there were technically two before her, but let's start with the one that actually wasn't cut. So back in 2002, the WB produced a show called Birds of Prey, and the show took place during a time where Batman dipped out and abandoned Gotham. So Batgirl, Huntress, Black Canary's daughter, who's also named Dinah, takes up the war against crime. In the show, Harley seems to be reformed and went back to doing psychiatric work, but spoilers for the show that got canceled after one season, Harley turned out to be the mastermind behind everything that the bop had to deal with over the course of the show. The show was a success for the first episode, but after ratings dipped significantly, they ended up canceling it, which seems to be an unfortunate, reoccurring thing for Harley during her early years. Now, on to the other live-action version of Harley that was filmed and ready to go, but because DC just doesn't seem to communicate across the shows and movies, the scene was cut. So, in Arrow's second season finale, there was supposed to be a scene that showed Harley as a part of the Suicide Squad, and was even voiced by Tara Strong, but because the first Suicide Squad was in development at the time, the higher-ups decided to cut the scene. And although we don't get to see her face, in an earlier episode, a character named Deranged Squad Female, who's also voiced by Strong, talks about how she's a trained therapist. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of the Arrowverse, but if they went in the same direction as the Injustice comic, where Oliver and Harley have a fun dynamic where they play off of each other, I think that that could have been a cool take. And since that won't be happening in the movies, at least for a long while, we'll just have to cherish what we have. Finally, let's talk about what could have been Harley's very first live action role. If Batman and Robin wasn't Batman and Robin, then there could have been a third movie to make the Schumacher trilogy. In that movie, which could have been titled Batman Unchained or Batman Triumphant, two titles I hope never get used, Harley Quinn was actually going to be Joker's daughter and would have teamed up with Scarecrow, who was going to be played by Nick Cage, who probably would have been great to try and take down the Bat. And both Madonna and Courtney Love were apparently frontrunners to be in the role. On paper, that does seem like a solid movie, but then you remember Batman and Robin, and yeah, I'm sure some of you in the comments will say, that's my favorite Batman movie, and I'm not supposed to be rude to the viewers, but you are wrong. Could it have been fun? Sure. Would it have been good? No. Probably not. Harley Quinn is considered by DC's own Jim Lee to be the fourth pillar of the publishing line, only behind Soup's bats and wonder woman and i think he's right when you look at the impact that she's had over the past 20 plus years it's kind of insane that such a throwaway character could have grown into the icon that she's become today 